what kept me alive? Well, I think determination and hatred. My hatred was so bad for him at this point until I, I had to live to see if I could get revenge. I needed revenge. By the summer of 1941, war was raging all across Europe and Southeast Asia, but the United States had no plans of joining in. So for 16-year-old Glenn Frazier, joining the U.S. Army was nothing more than an opportunity to give him a fresh start. I, I was a farm boy and I got sort of antsy and was ready to make a change. So I got on my motorcycle and I went down the road and I said, look out Army, here I come. So I pulled down on my motorcycle and the sergeant was watching me from the door and he said, can I help you? And I said, yeah, I want to join the Army. He said, how old are you? I said, 21. That's my first big lie and first uh, tremendous lie. An hour and a half later, they swore me in and I had three choices. Panama Canal, Alaska, or uh, Philippine Islands. And he sort of convinced me that he said that the Philippines was a paradise and I volunteered for the Philippines. But Glenn's stay in paradise would be short-lived. On December 7, 1941, Japan would launch a widespread assault across the Pacific, beginning with the attack on Pearl Harbor. Ten hours later, Japan invaded the Philippines. Although the combined American and Filipino forces outnumbered the Japanese, they were largely inexperienced, and the invasion just kept coming. All the Americans could do was fight and hold on to hope. We fought the Japanese for four months. We would sit there and listen day after day, supplies and reinforcements on the way, and they never came. After months of hard-fought defense, the Philippines were overrun. Some 100,000 American and Filipino troops were now prisoners of the Empire of Japan. It was doomsday for us. We, I mean, it was, it was hard to take. And it was just something that we, we thought it wouldn't happen. But it did happen, and when it happened, we were devastated. Exhausted and defeated, the captured soldiers were amassed at Maravellis, at the southern tip of Bataan. Not one of them could have known what horrors lie ahead. When we first got there, they were shooting people out back, and they were just continuously shooting people. They made a stand and lined up and, and take all of our belongings, everything we had on except our boxer shorts, and put it in the ground on the front, in front of us. And then took our canteen and poured the canteen, water out of our canteen and took us and told us to pick up our stuff and, and go join the march. Destined for a POW camp, 70,000 Allied prisoners were forced to march over 60 miles. Along the way, they were subjected to harsh cruelty, and thousands would not survive the march. And we saw it right on the death march. We saw him just take that saber and just cut a man's head off and uh, you know, just one swing. There was a big bomb crater, and they were, had the Americans trying to fill it up with rocks and you know, with shovels. And when the Americans got to the point where they couldn't shovel anymore, they kicked them in the water down in the, in the pit, and they had four Japanese over there with bamboo poles with a point on it, and they and put them down in the slush in the water, and then buried them alive. So it was six days and seven nights, no sleep, no water, no food, or no nothing. When I got to the end, I couldn't pick up my feet. My tongue was swelling. That's how, in what shape I was in. Starved, beaten, and weary, the prisoners finally reached Camp O'Donnell. But the end of their journey was only the beginning of what Glenn would refer to as hell on earth. In October of 1942, along with hundreds of other American prisoners, Glenn was shipped to a slave labor camp in Osaka, Japan. I worked in a lumber yard all day and it was cold. It was that particular day, it was eight degrees. So I was walking down the streets of Osaka, Japan with my hands in my pocket. 
And here this guard tells me to take my hands out of my pocket. So I took them out. And then when we got up to the camp, he told that guard at the gate and reported and pointed over that of me. Glenn was escorted to the prison guard house where an interpreter and a furious Japanese major were waiting for him. The major was sitting over there at a desk by himself and the interpreter kept arguing with me. You don't obey orders. All soldiers don't walk down the streets of Osaka or any other place with hands in pockets. You know that, you're a soldier. I said, no, I'm not a soldier. I'm a POW in Japan. So the major got sort of excited and he hit the desk with his fist and he says, take him outside. We're going to make an example of him. And so they took me outside and, and then they got it, gathered all the POWs in the camp. The major had come out and stuck his saber up here to my neck. And he said, you have a last word? And I said, yes, I do. And I looked at him and I opened my mouth and I didn't realize what I was saying. I said, he can kill me, but he cannot kill my spirit. And my spirit's gonna haunt him until he dies. Being a superstitious man, the Japanese major took Glenn's warning seriously and decided instead to put him in solitary confinement. I was up to a hole in the ground, five by five by five. And I was there seven days and seven nights and I lost it completely. I didn't know where I was. And I, I dream in and think, where, where am I? Where, where, what's my name? Do I have any family? Where have I come from? Well, when the guy opened the thing up seven days later, I couldn't stand up, so I was trying to pull myself up. And he stomped my hands on the edge of the hole in the ground. And he hit me back of the head with his rifle butt and knocked me unconscious. And I don't know how many times he kicked me in the ribs. And he broke three ribs on the right side and two on the left side. Beaten within an inch of his life, Glenn is convinced the only thing that kept him breathing was a feeling that began to burn from deep within. My hatred was so bad for him at this point until I, I had to live to see if I could get revenge. I needed revenge. But his hatred for the Japanese would only continue to be provoked. One day as Glenn and another soldier made their way to the camp hospital, a pair of Japanese fighter planes decided to rain more turmoil on their American captives. Here come two Zero fighters. They bombed and strafed the hospital. And when they started to leave, they came off, right off the road, right over us. I jumped in the right hole, the right ditch, and my friend jumped in the left ditch. And they dropped one little bomb. I got up and I looked for my friend and I didn't see him. And I looked over at that hole. I went over there and started looking around. I found his left foot in his left shoe, hit him direct. They deliberately hit the hospital, killed about 115 of our people in the, in the beds and a couple of nurses and so forth. And that time I flared with hatred. That grew every day. Nearly every day I had something else to help to fuel my hatred. Glenn remained a POW in Japan until August of 1945. When the second atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan surrendered, and the war was finally over. After nearly four years in captivity, the remaining American prisoners, now completely unguarded, simply walked out of the camp and boarded a train to freedom. But for Glenn Frazier, the war would continue to rage in his soul for decades to come. The horrors he experienced had developed a deep hatred within him that no amount of world peace could ever uproot. It just took first place in my system. So that I could not get rid of. I didn't want to get rid of it. I had my pride and I had, I said, I pride myself in saying, I'll kill them, I'll kill them, I'll kill them, I'll kill them, I'll kill some of them. Before I die, I'll get a chance to kill one of them. Uh, one night I was, I started having nightmares and instead of me being out of the situation, home safe, 
these dreams were just as real as if it happened to me, just like it happened. And the beatings and all that. When I woke up, I was on the floor on my knees and I was crying. But all this came back to me, inside of me, and saying, I can't do it, I can't do it, I can't do it. But I said, I've got to do it, I've got to get rid of it, I can't go on this way. That was a turning point in me, was making up my mind that I had to do it, to pray and pray and get rid of the hatred. So I started looking at the Japanese in a different, a different light. And I had to realize, I think inside, what and why did these people do this? The Japanese people for years was under control of a person like the emperor. They like it was, it was a god. And they were taught no tolerance for the enemy. Well, the Japanese people were really good people. They were really good people. Finally free of the inner turmoil that plagued him for much of his life, Colonel Glenn Fraser lived out the rest of his days using his experiences in the war as an opportunity to speak on the power of forgiveness. Hi everyone, I'm Josh from Memoirs of World War II and I just want to say thank you so much for watching this episode. If you'd like to learn more details and hear more stories from Colonel Fraser's wartime experience, you can check out his autobiography, Hell's Guest, available at his website, colonelfraser.com. We want to say a big thank you to Brad Bennett and the creators of the film, Forgive, Don't Forget, for donating the interview with Colonel Fraser for this episode. Brad and his team have created a truly inspiring and thought-provoking documentary that you'll definitely want to see. You can find out more about Forgive, Don't Forget in the links below. Our goal is to capture as many World War II veteran stories as we can from all over the world, but we can't do it alone. If you'd like to help us in this mission, consider supporting us through Patreon and check out our website in the links below for more information. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss a single episode. We want to say thank you for your support and thanks for watching.